from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 125, recorded on January 19th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today in a cloudy day in New York City are my two fine, exceptional, brilliant co-hosts, Dixon Depommier and Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> you like That's the, a twiv. You, you can tell I'm lying, right? Um, about, the, exaggerating about the weather? Little, what, yeah, what about the you? weather. Notice that we, oh, about the weather, of course. <laughs> uh, of course, of course. Yeah, it's the weather, of course. That's what I mean. It's actually sunny, beautiful day. That's well. Is it cold out? You just came here. It's not. So. It's not. It's nice, actually. Really? But it is cloudy. It's bizarrely warm. Come on. Sun was out for a while, then. This is a weird time of the year for this kind of weather, by the way. Well, normally it's very cold, right? Yeah, normally it should but be. It but it will get cold again. And you told me today that NASA and uh, USGS announced that last year was the warmest year. Third year in a row. In a year in a row. Third Tra- year temperatures row. rising. The Arctic ice is, free- is melting. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shall we remind people of our case? <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Let's okay. remind people. Let's do it. Let's so, do it. So, the case from TWIP 124, for those of you tuning back in and those of you coming to us for the first time, this was a case of a 28 year old um, male uh, and seen in a referral hospital. And uh, this man had come from near the Thai Burma border. Uh, he was reporting fever and chills um, for a couple of days, feeling poorly, and reporting a small amount of dark urine. He had severe shaking chills. These are occurring one time per day. Uh, doesn't report any rash, no diarrhea. There is some difficulty breathing, or no, no difficulty breathing reported. He's seen by a local healthcare volunteer, went to the hospital, and then ends up in the tertiary care hospital in Bangkok. Uh, we reported that he had exposure history to pigs, dogs, insects. Uh, he was involved in the timber industry. Um, he's usually a farmer, but he goes up into this area for extra work um, in the timber industry. Uh, while working up in the in the timber industry area on the Thai-Burmese border, he sleeps out at night with no cover, um, just wearing his clothes and sandals. He doesn't take any medicines. He's not married, and his... Um, lives with his family. His family is fine. Uh, He sleeps in a dwelling when he's not up in the forest, uh, but they have no screens. He reports no toxic habits. He's HIV negative. Uh, He is sexually active, but I think for Vincent's benefit, we mentioned he doesn't (laughs) doesn't go to the brothels. Right. (laughs) Okay. Uh, When we see him, he's got a high fever. He's got a low blood pressure. He's got a rapid heart rate. He is breathing rapidly. Uh, he's got scleral icterus, so the whites of his eyes are now a little bit yellow. Dry mucous membranes. Uh, his neck is supple. His lungs are clear. He does have a two out of six systolic murmur. His abdomen is soft, a um, little tender. He has an enlarged liver and spleen. Many cuts, bruises, bug bites. We notice on his labs that he has low platelets, a low hematocrit, low glucose, uh, and he has an abnormal blood smear, which um, we shared last time. Five to ten percent of his RBCs are infected, and multiple band forms are seen. Daniel, what does it mean? Two out of six systolic murmur. You know, we grade um, the volume of a systolic murmur from well, there's none to one through six. I see. Six is so loud you can hear it as mm-hmm. you enter the room. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and right. two is two is. Uh, Two, two is you you can hear it. Three is you actually can feel it. Uh-huh. It's that significant. Okay. All right. We had a bunch of case guesses. The first from Daniel. Dear Twip superheroes, <laughs> this time I hope to redeem myself by not mentioning any diseases named after Nazis. 
It sounds like the 28-year-old man from Thailand with periodic high fever and chills has malaria, although he has an atypical pattern of fever. The clinical and lab findings, hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, low platelets, anemia, infected red cells all support this diagnosis. The severity of his illness is consistent with the plasmodium falciparum, but the blood film appears to show plasmodium malariae with band-formed trophozoites and normal-sized red cells. P. malaria causes a milder chronic illness. So, probable diagnosis, P. nolzi, monkey malaria, a zoonotic infection found in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Morphologically similar to P. malariae on microscopy, P. nolzi has a shorter life cycle and can cause daily spikes of fever and a rapid increase in parasite count. PCR confirms the diagnosis. As he has over 2% parasitemia, hypotension, and renal failure, the treatment of choice would be intravenous artesanate or quinine if this is not available. What was the outcome? Best wishes, Dan. <laughs> London, UK. Right. Dixon. Wink writes, my guess for the case of the Thai lager is P. Nolzai because of the geographic location, presumed proximity to monkeys, band forms, and high parasitemia. The organomegaly suggests chronic malaria, so I wonder if he has more than one parasite or ticks and fleas, as they say. <laughs> That's from Wink. Annual. David writes, Dear hosts, I believe the young man in Bangkok has contracted a case of malaria, particularly malaria spurned by the species Plasmodium vivax. P. vivax is particularly dominant in areas of Asia, such as Myanmar and Thailand. This also happens to be the particular species that causes splenomegaly and has been found to rupture from erythrocytes within 48 hours of mirozoite invasion, which may fit the man's two-day onset of chills. According to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, P. vivax infection typically causes around 2% infection RBCs, but in this particular case, the man may have a higher parasite load due to the development of hepatosplenomegaly and the high number of mosquito bites garnered while sleeping outside. The man's other symptoms, jaundice, dark urine, difficulty breathing, are indicative of other malarial infections. So it is possible that since there is a higher RBC infection rate, and multiple band forms present, he may have another species of malaria infecting him, particularly P. malariae, which causes big spleen disease in tropical regions. Treatment includes antimalarials such as chloroquine, mefloquine, or artemisinin-based treatment. Once again, thanks for the informative podcast. Sincerely, David P. Mohammed writes, good evening, Twip Trio from cold, dark, foggy London, UK. I just last sent in an answer to a case study a couple of months ago while completing the diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. Mm -hmm. I found your podcast to be an invaluable source of information and enjoyment while studying parasitology for my exams. And having finished the course, I'm trying my best not to let the knowledge I've gained slip. With that in mind, here's my answer for the most recent case. When Dr. Griffin first mentioned band forms... My immediate thought went to Plasmodium malariae, the trophozoid of which classically assumes a band form shape within infected red blood cells. However, there were a couple of features of the case that challenged this diagnosis. First, the high parasite count in this patient is not something you would typically expect with P. malariae, which preferentially infects older, hence smaller RBCs that wouldn't typically cause a parasitemia greater than a few percent. Secondly, the daily or quotidian nature of the fever, while being perhaps a slightly soft sign, it again is not typical of P. malaria, in which fevers classically occur every 72 hours. I'm sure you guys have discussed the ridiculous naming system of <laughs> fever frequency with malaria before. A fever occurring every three days is called quadern. <laughs> Thirdly, we had an interesting discussion about this patient's job, which would put him outside during the day in forested areas. Interestingly, I believe Anopheles mosquitoes in this part of the world are often day-biting, perhaps mitigating any effect of the patient not sleeping under a net. More importantly, his work might bring him to the vicinity of macaques in the forest. These happen to be the reservoir host for Plasmodium nolzi, which is my guess for the case study. This zoonotic parasitic infection is associated with morphology similar, similar to P. malariae, but causes daily fevers and can have very high levels of parasitemia, which in turn can make people very sick. It's also geographically limited to Southeast Asia, in particular Malaysia and Borneo, but I assume it has made it as far as Thailand. Treatment would be as per other severe malarial infections with IV artesina and supportive care until the patient has improved and then oral artemisinin in combination therapy to complete treatment. He could also probably do with some advice 
to wear long sleeve clothing when working yeah. outside. Perhaps someone could come up with insecticide treated shirts and trousers for these guys to wear. <laughs> anyway, I hope the patient recovered well. I look forward to hearing the outcome. Happy New Year to all of you. Please keep up the great work. Dixon. Niraj writes Dear Twip Ponderers, this is Niraj from gloomy, murky, and insanely wet Bay Area in California. Don't get me wrong, I'm totally in. F- for all the rain we're getting to help us make the deficit make yeah make the deficit for the looming drought but there's just something about gray skies i just hate them mm-hmm. apart from this i am glad that twip released a podcast earlier in the year and based on dr griffin's presentation of the symptoms of the latest case for the male at the burma thai border i would like to suggest that the man is suffering from malaria all the physiological symptoms like shaking chills and no a diarrhea along with low glucose and RBC infections, a whopping 10, 5 to 10%, point towards an advanced infection of malaria. I think the prescribed course of medication would be artemisinin coupled with antibiotics. On a different note, I was recently reading about toxoplasma, and while browsing the website of, for journal, the journal Cell, I came across an interesting paper, please find attached. In this manuscript, the authors describe an intrinsically disordered protein, IDP, namely GRA, 24, and show how it activates a mechanical MAP kinase pathway to maintain infectivity. Personally, I've always loved working with proteins, as I think there is something very definite about the in vitro experiments one can do with purified components. Obviously, it's a reductionist point of view, like most science, but it can give one the kind of insights that can be fascinating. At least, that's the way I feel. And for example, this paper had a figure showing the structure of a complex between IDP and P38 MAPK solved using SACS-S. Dr. Dr. Racaniello, I was listening to the recent episode on TWIM about the bacterial califer protein, so thought you might be interested in seeing the diverse roles SACS-X technique can serve, although I still think the resolution on the order of angstrom scale presented in that manuscript was a stretch. In any case, Thanks always for a wonderful podcast. It's always a pleasure and great listening experience to listen to the esteemed group of twipologists, both conducting and listening to the podcast. I can't remember a single episode from which I never learned plentiful. Please keep the ball rolling and there's, and here's to an infectiously rewarding 2017 of scientific discoveries. Best Naraj. Daniel. Tony writes, Dear Parasitologists, As always, here is another very interesting case. The clinical picture is that of a young patient with a fever and dark urine. This last suggests cholurea being hyperbilirubinemia, one possible cause. In the clinical practice, among the long list of possible infectious causes of fever in tropical countries, one must always consider typhoid, fever, and blood cultures should be taken. The symptoms... The hyperbilirubinemia and the fact that our patient had frequent contacts with animals also suggest leptospirosis, which is highly prevalent in tropical countries, and of course highly endemic in Southeast Asian countries. Dengue fever is always something to think of. Said that, and assuming this is a case of human infection, not penguins this time, (laughs) the case strongly points to human malaria. The band forms are typical for both Plasmodium malariae and Plasmodium nolzii. The first one is rare even in endemic countries. The second is recognized today as an emerging infection and in endemic countries such as Malaysia may be the most frequent diagnosed species. Microscopy cannot really tell the difference between both species, so PCR test is mandatory. P. nolzai causes higher levels of parasitemia and the prognosis is a bit poorer than that of P. malaria. This species is zoonosis and different monkey species are considered the natural hosts. Deforestation is leading to an increase in the incidence since it brings human beings, monkeys, and Anopheline mosquitoes into close contact. So, in the former scenario, the parasite follows the cycle mosquito, monkey, mosquito, monkey. But in the new one, the cycle has changed to a monkey, mosquito, human, or simply human, mosquito, human, as in the case for the other four human species. Our patient works in the timber industry making the contact with the parasite much more likely. Otherwise, one cannot rule out a mixed infection by different plasmodium species, and again, PCR would help in the diagnosis. So, my best guess, this is a case of P. nolzai infection, or a mixed infection involving, in any case, P. nolzai. P.S. 
It seems to me very interesting to add that P. nolzai is not a new discovered species. In fact, it was once used by Dr. Julius wagner Yoreg as a treatment for patients with neurosyphilis with some success. The idea was to generate fever as Treponema pallidum is a thermolabile microorganism. The parasite was transmitted intravenously from one patient to the next. In fact, we could see Dr. Wagner as a vector, a <laughs> human anopheline. Unluckily, after some passages between patients, the resultant strain gained at virulence, complications began to occur, and the treatment had to be stopped. For these achievements in 1927, Dr. Julius Wagner Yoreg received for this work the Nobel Prize in Medicine, being actually the first psychiatrist to win the Nobel Prize. Mm. Thank you very much. I anxiously wait for the next episode. Mm. We got a lot of stuff to talk about here. This is yes, this, these are great we emails. Do. <laughs> You'll see Fried's dear twipats. My guess as to the diagnosis of our Thai patient would be malaria. There aren't many things that infect RBCs, and since Babesia is limited to the U.S., I believe malaria is a safe bat. Plasmodium falciparum is the most common species to cause infection in Thailand. There's a good amount of resistance found within the country. This combined with the fact that 5 to 10% of RBCs are infected caused me to worry greatly for our patient. On up-to-date, there is a criteria for diagnosing someone with severe malaria. In our patient, if the glucose is less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, parastemia over 7%, H&H less than 7 grams per DL, 20% respectively, or any episode of major bleeding would be enough to categorize this as severe. It's a good thing he was able to get to a hospital as soon as he did. I would start our artesanate treatment as soon as possible along with IV fluids with glucose. Depending on how bad his anemia is, I would consider packed RBC transfusion. I hope patient was able to get better All right Dixon Ryan and Perrin Wright dear doctors we're two students writing in for the first time from Ontario where we're currently experiencing mild January temperatures in the two degree C range we've been listening for a while and thought it was about time to take a crack at a case in regards to the case discussed in episode 420 uh, 124 Given geographical location, quotidian fever, spleen, and liver involvement, as well as the risk factor of sleeping outdoors at night, we guess that the patient is suffering from malaria. Based on the information, we think P. falciparum is the most likely culprit, although a 5 to 10% infection R rate of RBCs seems high. This could be explained by increased exposure to hungry mosquitoes or perhaps an immunocompromised status. Given his age and ongoing residency in this area, we'd expect a higher degree of immunity and so sp suspect an underlying condition. P. vivax also seems a potential organism, however, has lower prevalence in the area and additionally only infects reticulocytes and so rarely would reach this level of parasitemia. We expect to see infected red blood cells of normal size. We suspect that this is a new infection, not a recrudescence, as would be seen with P. vivax. We suggest treatment with atovaquone, proguanol, or doxycycline. Looking forward to seeing if we are correct in our first TWIB diagnosis. Hmm. Well, we was had, right. We had a number of nulzies, didn't we? We did. In fact, we did. most of them. Well, Dixon, what do you think? Well, you know, without seeing the blood smear. <laughs> you know, I was thrown off well, originally when I, heard, when I read the case again that the hepatosplenomegaly was, it's not a red herring in this case because obviously P. knows I can do that. But, but knowing where this patient is from, I was instantly drawn to a mixed diagnosis of malaria plus. Hmm. And the plus was um, visceral leishmaniasis because of the likelihood that it could be in the area, and that is a first-class inducer of hepatosplenomegaly. So that's that was my original diagnosis, but in, in retrospect, I think if I just tempered it down to penal's eye, I think it probably fits the picture best. Ah, oh, gee, you were so strident about that. I, I, I was, I was actually, I was, I was. But I, I think I'm convinced by the overwhelming... Uh, Majority of people who actually read the uh, section <laughs> in Parasitic Diseases sixth edition on Pinozai that that perhaps I was a little hasty in my judgment. So with with infected RBCs and hepatosplenomegaly, Nolzi is a good candidate. I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. Uh, I think it, it 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 yeah. And him going into the forest it's there, it's not a stretch. Yeah. Okay. I and, think and deforestation is is a big deal in that area right now. So I think uh, right. it's too bad, but it is. 
Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, that's what but I'm thinking. you know what? We have the world's expert sitting world's to my expert right, right here with the laboratory <laughs> results. So let's that's see. basically so let, let me, what yeah, we would let, need. Let's, let's walk through like what I, you know, as I always say, I always try to pick <laughs> cases that I think, you know, this is, uh, I think this, this is Agatha Christie, right? Exactly. You know, we sort of, you, if you think enough, you, you can hopefully get this. So the first um, hint, and I think I, I gave a lot here, was I said we had 5 to 10% of the RBCs infected, so, mm-hmm. so not one or two. Right. And um, we, saw, we saw some people try to explain away, <laughs> say, well, I think it's one that where we see one or two, and I'm going to come up with some hand-waving for why we get sure. more. But why do we only get one or 2% for Vivax, Ovalley, or malaria? Well, my um, <laughs> take on that is that <laughs> if, if this person is from an endemic area, then that's because they have uh, immune memory, and it kicks in, and it limits the number of red cells that can be mm. infected. And the other is the, the tropism. They can only infect. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think this is. They can only infect either, you know, depending on species, um, for Vivax, Ovalley, and malaria. They only have the ability to infect either very young, so reticulocytes, which are yeah. about 1%, mm-hmm. right. or the very old, which, again, the senescent, only about 1%. Right. So it doesn't matter how robust or how many mosquito bites – you're not going to get above two percent. Got it. Um, so that so once you get above two percent, you got to come up with something. P. falciparum right? is the only other choice. Well, P. falciparum and <laughs> but they don't and have nulls. Yeah, that's right. And nulls. So those are the two. So you're you're above two percent. So you got to say, okay, it's got to be, you know, something. You know, you need to be considering falciparum or nulls eye in here. Right. Uh, the next is you look at the forms. Now, you know, you see particular forms. When you see the band forms, those are typical for malaria. Mm, that's correct. When you get above this percent, you've got to say, okay, either I have a mixed infection, mm. and if I see, like, very few band forms, okay, it's malaria and falciparum. That's one mm. explanation. Mm-hmm. And that's, awesome. that's decent. I've seen falciparum mixed with other species sure. with lots of, you know, you, you think, oh, this is great, falciparum. And then you start looking closely, or you do your PCR, you do your rapid, and you realize it's a mixed infection. That that happens. Um, And so in that case, you'd see rare band forms. You'd see what you're mainly seeing is rare band forms from malaria, but then you're seeing, you know, 8%, 10% from a severe falciparum infection. If I can inject just a moment. Go, Because when you're used to seeing a mixed infection, um, around New York City, just uh, during or after New Year's mm-hmm. is the time where you'll get a lot of transfusion malaria because the blood banks are almost tapped out dry. People are away on vacations. They're not giving blood. So they have to look for other blood supplies. And a lot of times they looked to Central and South America mm-hmm. for their blood supplies. And, and they came, of course. And they, they we once had a case where they received five pints of blood. Three were positive for malaria with two different species. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a wow. I mean, no kidding. That's <laughs> that is. eye opener. Holy cow! How can this possibly be? But but there it was. There was there was the proof. So you're right. If you don't think of uh, the fact that it could be a zebra and a horse, mm-hmm. then you're going to miss the boat. Yeah. So which is why I thought about Cala Azar as a possible second infection. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I and I think at this point you you know as people pointed out. When you're just looking at the morphology, you're going to have trouble, which is where the PCR comes in. Exactly. So, so in this case, we've got a guy from an area where they have this particularly interesting type of malaria. We're seeing multiple band mm. forms. I want to try to point out there wasn't just a few rare in there. So, <laughs> yeah. so it seems like whatever malaria is involved is one that can form band forms. Yeah. Um, the, a PCR was actually done to, uh, to confirm that this was um, – Nolzai infection. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And I used to pronounce this Nolesi, but as we know, this was named after a gentleman. <laughs> Nolzai. <laughs> and so, right. Knowles. So, Knowles, you know, yeah, Nolzai. Nolzai. That, that makes sense. Nolzai. Um, there's a few other things. So, so people uh, seemed a little concerned about the hepatosplenomegaly. Yeah, I and, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is telling. So, I have a patient in the hospital right now. I won't mention any specifics other than the fact that she's got a really big tender spleen. And uh, she actually has endocarditis, a big infection. Oh. And people used to use the terminology reticuloendothelial system. Indeed. And yeah. so, you know, yes. basically pointing out the fact that the liver and the spleen are organs with lots of immune cells. So when someone has a serious infection, um, you will actually get a enlargement, tender spleen and liver. Mm-hmm. Um, and malaria is a particular um, driver of this. So it doesn't necessarily need to be chronic, I'll say. 
Um, you know, and actually in the WHO criteria, when they like, you know, you're out there in the fields, you're limited diagnostics, um, fever, mm -hmm. compatible symptoms, large spleen, um, that'll actually allow you to make this clinical um, criteria diagnosis of malaria. Right. So it doesn't need, it doesn't need to necessarily be um, a chronic um, to get the enlarged liver and spleen. But the proof, of course, is during treatment, does the patient get better? And if, he, if they do, do these band forms disappear and does the spleen mm -hmm. and liver return to normal? And in this, in this case, I think also I want to point out, because you bring up an interesting issue, is that once you make the diagnosis of malaria, you're done. You just go, that's, you, right. you don't that's to, it. He's got malaria. Nothing and, else is going on. Well, um, you know, when you got 8 to 10%, Malaria is probably your big thing going on. Right. But as we pointed out, a lot of these people will have um, bacterial sepsis at the same time. Sure. They, they'll they have dengue. They'll, we saw a patient, um, this was this last summer, and uh, it was, sure, they have malaria, but what they really brought them in was acute dengue. Hmm. And so a lot of these people, particularly living in an area, let's say it was you know it was 1%, a half a percent parasitemia, yeah. but now they're in the hospital They've been living in an endemic area. That half a percent uh, makes me say, "Fine, you have malaria, but what's actually making you sick?" Mm -hmm. And That's it right. can very well be a second. And I think we had some people writing in making that suggestion. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we have that was interesting? I yeah, we had a few. We had a lot of interesting. Um... Oh, the naming of the fevers. <laughs> right. Well, that's Hippocrates. You can just blame Hippocrates on that one. The Greeks didn't really have a great way of counting. <laughs> um, because they counted the last day of the fever as the first day of the next round of fever. So, you know, that's how these names got sort of mixed up. So, so they weren't big on zero, right? So what's today? Today's on day one. That's if right. you have a fever tomorrow, that's fever on day two. You're that's like, right. well, okay. And Euclid's <laughs> over in the corner pulling his hair. Like, what are you guys doing? Can't you start with time zero, day zero, <laughs> tomorrow is one day later? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm. But that's who named them, and, and we were stuck with that system. I find it very I, – I still – I have to every so often try to remind myself of how the crazy numbering works. It's idiosyncratic. Um, Babesia? There was a comment that Babesia is only here no, in North oh, America, course, and I not, saw that's – not, That's not true, though. Saw my colleague here cringe. Yeah. Um, there's Babesia in other parts of the world. Of course, Europe. Of course. Europe um, and lots – and Africa, too. Yeah. So that's not – you know, we think of it, and it's interesting when they – when the new fellows, new ID fellows come and they go um, to Stony Brook out in Eastern Long Island, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of this, and then they, there's this Long Island Infections Disease Society where you bring your unknowns, and they always bring one, and they're all excited, and mm. we're like, yeah, is that Babesia? Because <laughs> 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 you, right. you see a lot of it. I mean, right. Lots yep. of cases. And then and, there was a mention of a treating of patients with malaria to get rid of their um, a treponema infection. Inverted. And Inverted. that has resurfaced. Treponema. That has recently resurfaced oh, yeah. for West Nile virus. I actually, uh, when the original epidemic occurred back in 1999, the following year, some people developed the neurological symptoms. And because of the fact that it's uh, a brain hmm. infection caused by a spirochete, right. okay, well, and you can't get the drug to where you want it to go, let's raise the body temperature and, and see what happens. Isn't there, aren't there, other ways of doing that now. <laughs> raising raising the yeah, body temperature or malaria. treating people with... Uh, you to know, raise the core temperature, couldn't you run this through a heart-lung machine and just raise the temperature up to 40 degrees or something like this? I'm still thinking treating with penicillin as I go. <laughs> but it is amazing. I mean, my understanding is that this worked. Is that, it did work. Um, yeah, is that syphilis, treponema pallidum, yeah, no, is a very heat-sensitive organism. And when they gave people these... Um, this malaria, they actually got better. And it's a little known, actually. People think of, oh, Nolzai is this brand new thing. But no, it was used therapeutically. Sure. Someone's got a Nobel Prize. Sure. So sure. it's been known about for a while. Yeah. What has not been known about is, is probably how often it infects people. And I still remember the first case, you know, it was very interesting. Some U.S. Um, citizen in interesting parts of the world for interesting reasons. <laughs> I see. Anthropology, no doubt. <laughs> a lot of CIA agents with the claim to be anthropologists. <laughs> so, how did you treat this patient? Uh, this patient got our IV artesanate, mm -hmm. um, as well as doxycycline was added as a second agent. And that's, that's a little interesting, right? It's... Um, you want a, sh a quick acting effective therapy um, that's going to reduce the parasitemia quickly. Mm -hmm. And artesanate's 
by the next day it was down to 1%. So it's a very effective therapy. So he responded very quickly. Um, he did very well very quickly. Mm. Now, the second, like what is the second drug? And you have many choices. Mm -hmm. And often people, as we say, they, they want to cover because you're not sure malaria is the only thing going on. So in an area maybe where there's scrub typhus or some of these other things, doxycycline might be quickly added as a second. Yeah. Clindamycin might be quickly added if people are thinking of a bacterial sepsis. Um, and sometimes they don't really wait until the next day or two. And I think I remember when I was in India, um, someone making a comment, you're so quick to add that second drug. <laughs> Is it because you're not sure it's really just malaria? And, you know, you, you, there's no reason to wait. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait. Yeah, no, you don't. So. All right. So there we have it. There we have it. Pinozzi. Yeah, I think there was also, what is it? Was it Yosef who pointed out? There are criteria for severity, and this patient had severe malaria. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's important, I think, to characterize them, decide, am I going to give them IV therapy? Yeah. Um, will they need um, to be given a transfusion? We no longer do exchange transfusions, yeah. mm. um, really just because there's, there's not evidence. And Usually it's one of those things, everyone gets so excited setting that up, and then you realize, like, has anyone treated the malaria? And they're like, well, I'm too busy setting up the exchange transfusion. Right. So treat the malaria. I'm not sure exchange transfusion is uh, a benefit, uh, but if they get below certain levels, there's this expert consensus and recommendations. And I, I think we put this all in our, in our book as well to help yeah, people. Right. The real miracle, I think, of treating a malaria case like this, this person, three more days, they would have been dead. Three more right. days, Three this more person days, yeah. got up and walked out of the hospital with no side effects. Yep. That's yeah. remarkable. That is to say, there's no long-lasting pathological consequences, which a lot of other infections have is associated with them. I'm sure basement membrane disease might be a long-term consequence of chronic infection, but in this case, I think uh, it's, it's looked at as a small miracle that these people actually feel themselves. Mm. They say, I can't believe I was so sick, and the next thing you know, they're not there anymore. They're out. Yeah, this person did great. They went on. That's fantastic. And, uh, that is, that's a modern. He is back to sleeping in the woods. Back to sleeping <laughs> well, in the woods and cutting timber and all that good will stuff. Will he get infected again with the good. same strain? Good. That's that's unfortunately the um, sure. this pre immunity this this tolerance is mm -hmm. is short lived and it's species specific. Um, so you'll see people living in an area where there's um, Vivax or Ovala, yeah. for instance, and then, boom, they get hit with falciparum or they get hit with mm. Noll's eye, and, and they don't really have a so. cross protection. So, mm. And then again, right, we have, they come here, they come to Columbia, <laughs> and they're here for a few years, and then they go back home, and then oh. they get really sick because, wow, they get sick. you know, once you've, once you've left, you That's know. That's right. Hmm. Yeah, it's sad that uh, this has not got more... Um, more stick to itiveness, so to speak. The but maybe we'll, just maybe we'll talk about, maybe remember. there is some way to create um, an immunity that will protect people to malaria. So we should, maybe. I don't know if there's any papers out there. But no, maybe. probably not. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We shall, after I tell you about this episode's sponsor, Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system. You'd be interested in that, Dixon. Absolutely. Setting the highest standards for ingredients and building a community of home chefs. Now, let me tell you, uh, I love to eat. I'm not so excited about cooking because you have to do too much preparation. And, yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. But Blue Apron will send you everything you need in a box. And we got a couple of these last week, and man, it's really easy. It's great. It's fresh. All the stuff is really good. They deliver, they deliver seasonal recipes with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Every meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card, pre-portioned ingredients, and you can prepare these in 40 minutes or less. If you spend a lot of time and money eating out or at high-end grocery chains, we won't mention any of those, <laughs> this will cost you less than $10 a person for a healthy home-cooked meal. It's really, really good. So we had chicken souvlaki with broccoli and crispy salmon with Meyer lemon aioli. They give you everything you need except salt, pepper, and oil. And wine. And wine. Well, they'll actually sell you that as well if you want. <laughs> but they give you spice. If you need spices, really? you, know, you don't have to go out and buy a whole bottle of the spice. They'll send you little don't. packets of it. How about that? 
They have a community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S. Their seafood is sustainably sourced under standards developed in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. Produce is sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming. Look at that. And because they ship exactly what you need, they're reducing food waste. You can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences and choose a delivery option that fits your needs. You can get meals for four or two people. There's no weekly commitment. You can get deliveries when you want them, and they deliver to 99% of the continental U.S. We had ours delivered last Friday, and ours the next order is going to come tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. Nice. If you go to their website, you'll get very hungry. You can choose from a variety of new recipes every week, or they can surprise you, but they're not repeated within a year. They do not repeat a recipe within one year, so you're never going to wow. get bored. That's, That's amazing. Here are some upcoming <laughs> recipes. <laughs> Spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with oh. cabbage and furikake. Pork chops and garlic piccata with scallion rice and spinach. Butternut squash pasta with butter, lettuce, and apple salad. Ah, oh, getting so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, it's not hard. It's not hard to do. I started to work on it, and then I had to go pick up my son. And I got back, my wife was done. I had chopped up the um, broccoli, <laughs> put it on a pan, covered, uh, sp- sprinkled it with salt and pepper, put some oil on it, mixed it up, and put it in the oven. They're going to have roasted broccoli. It's fantastic. Delicious. Yeah, good stuff. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. That's blueapron.com slash twip. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. This is really good. Now, I think this is a good match for TWIP listeners because you're all busy. You don't have time to do anything except work. And uh, you want to eat, right? So check it out. Less than 10 bucks a recipe. Really easy to do. You'll feel really good about it. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. We thank Blue Apron for their support of TWIP. How about that for a sponsor, huh? Nice. Very nice. You hungry? I'm getting there. <laughs> you get a free, free a late lunch. Free meals for free. Yeah. All right. Paper time. This is very interesting. This is a paper in Science Translational Medicine entitled Complete Attenuation of Genetically Engineered Plasmodium Falciparum Sporozoites in Human Subjects. Right. First author is James Kublin. The last is Stefan Kopp. And this is a consortium of in, of individuals from the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Seattle, the University of Washington, and the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. Malaria. We just talked about malaria, didn't we? We did, we actually. Did. Son of a gun. In 2015, WHO reported 214 million cases and 438,000 deaths. Good Lord. That's mostly P. falciparum, right? Yes. Mostly P. falciparum and the... The majority of those deaths, I'd say more than 90%, are in children. And wow. in sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa. That's right. That's yeah. right. All right. So uh, we need a vaccine, right? Absolutely. And uh, a lot of people are working on this, right, Dixon? A lot of people. The most clinically advanced vaccine is a subunit formulation, yep. which uh, delivers the a major PF, plasmodium falciparum, sporozoid surface protein. The circumsporozoite protein. I'm a little circumspect about that. I am too, actually. (laughs) CSP. (laughs) They had a recent phase three trial. Yep. Showed some efficacy, but it was well below the goal of 75%. I think that was kind of the way they were. Well below the goal of 75%. (laughs) What was was, the efficacy? Does anyone know offhand? Was it like 15%? I mean, it was very, very low. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, it it was was horrible. It was a little above normal. Yeah, so so, when they say well, but it was well below 75%. So far below that it was underneath it. (laughs) So several studies have shown that using live parasites can get sterilizing immunity, but this is um, tough, right, because they can infect you. So people have tried radiation attenuated sporozoite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I knew the person who did that. Are we talking uh, about Traeger again? No, we're talking about uh, Jerry Vandenberg oh. at uh, NYU. That's mm-hmm. where you got your medical degree, as I recall. That is true. Listen uh, to this, so. Daniel. Sorry, I'm sorry. To no, that's okay. They, they, another approach is immunization with infectious sporozoites and then treating with an anti-malarial drug to make sure you don't get malaria. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, a, that's a difficult It's a little course, iffy. Right? 
you know, that's that's what you're doing right when you go to visit these areas. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> because a lot of these medicines don't work, uh, so and you still get you still get the, the sporozoites into you. The sporozoites still get into your liver. They still, but then you're treating the erythrocytic phase. Mm. And so when people come back, that's why I have to keep taking some of these medicines for another four weeks because they're still infected with malaria. Sure, you yeah, didn't yeah. prevent malaria; you prevented them from getting sick. That's right. Um, some of the yeah. ones. Um, you know, actually have effects on the liver phase, and those you could finish after just, you know, a week after you're back. Yeah. So that's an important point. We should say that the vaccination attempts are to target the pre-erythrocytic sporozoa, right? So maybe we should talk pre- about the life cycle just yes. to kind of reorient that, everybody. That would be a good Absolutely. idea. I mean, actually, there was an email where someone made a comment that we should talk about. So... um you want to? Want you? You're the parasitology guy. He is. He is. <laughs> Ooh, me? Dixon, oh, the parasitology right. guy. I am a parasitology guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's it. do this. All right. So malaria is um, now five Time's species. Up. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to make this long. Obviously, um, but it could be very long because it's a big subject. So five species, all transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. Worldwide distribution, mostly tropics and subtropics. Uh, and it requires a mosquito to actually bite you, although you can get your malaria by transfusion. Uh, it does not repeat. It does not cross the placenta mm-hmm. during pregnancy, so pregnant women do not transfer this infection to their babies. But during birth, there is the possibility for a mother's blood to contaminate the child, and, and in that way, children could acquire malaria at birth. But uh, otherwise, it's not a... Um, a congenital infection, uh, which is lucky because otherwise it would really be des- devastating. So uh, the parasite begins uh, in the mosquito, which is the definitive host. That is the stage of the infection that harbors the sexual stages. And they produce a stage which is an asexual haploid organism called the sporozoid. Mm-hmm. And the sporozoites float freely in the hemocele of the mosquito and eventually end up in the salivary glands in the head of the, of the mosquito the female only. And when the mosquito then bites an individual to obtain a blood meal for egg production, she injects into the bite wound a series of proteins and and, um, biologically active molecules, which affects the blood flow, it affects the immune system, it affects uh, coagulation of blood, all these other things. Uh, It's got a regular pharmacopoeia of salivary secretions and, of course, the sporozoites. Didn't we have a big talk about how, like, they probe until they hit? The, yeah, they uh, have a heat sensing device which allows them to actually hone in on a capillary. Yeah, they uh, based on heat. We sh- we showed that v- video. We talked about it. Yeah, they yeah they the, probe, and <laughs> so some of them are being injected <laughs> while they're probing, and then true. they hit, and That's boom, true. the rest get injected. So it's a mix. It's right. So, but the assumption is that the female mosquito must inject the sporozoites directly into the blood supply in order for the infection to to proceed. So let's say that happens. So the sporozoites now circulate throughout the body until they encounter the right receptor molecule, just like a virus. So, Vincent, where do you suppose that receptor molecule is? Hmm. Could it be on red blood cells? Nope. Liver cells? Nope. Yeah. Well, there's no other cell in the body. Well, Well, the, the liver cells are protected by some vessels. These are sinusoidal vessels, which allow the serum proteins to come out of the liver Mm -hmm. and enter the blood supply in a rapid fashion. So there is a receptor on the endothelial cells of sinusoidal tissues, which this uh, sporozoite then recognizes by encountering it. Mm -hmm. When it does, it's sort of like a lock and key or a Velcro system. Bang, the, the the sporozoite connects up, and then that stimulates the sporozoite to penetrate beyond the uh, sinusoidal Mm -hmm. vessel, and now it's into the spaces which have the, um, the, uh, the uh, parenchymal cells. And so the parenchymal cells are the targets for this parasite. And pre- yeah, and I presume that there's another uh, receptor molecule that the parasite must mm-hmm. encounter before it gets into a hepatocyte. But My understanding is yes. And actually, this is sort of sure. subtle, right? Because we think of it going to the liver, but as you point yeah, out, there's, there's sinus- there right sin- sinusoidal endothelial cells <laughs> that right. they get into, That's traverse, right. Right. and then there actually are receptors on the yeah. hepatocytes. That's so right. this is the pre-erythrocytic stage. Mm, abs- still, still and this is still, still, And this is what we'd like to target with a vaccine. Get absolutely. The, get those sporozoites. You bet. Right? You okay. bet. So then it gets into an hepatocyte and it undergoes division. Mm-hmm. 
And it I'm produces just... something called a cryptozoite, mm-hmm. which is meaning that you can't see it. That's It's inapparent because it doesn't come into the blood mm-hmm. supply. It enlarges the hepatocyte so large that it ruptures. When okay. it does so, the, the cryptozoites now transform miraculously into merozoites. <laughs> I believe that they're the same thing, but <laughs> they're called different things. So yeah. we will call them different things too. So the merozoite is the infectious unit for the red cells. Got it. And indeed, there is a receptor for that too. And the Duffy blood group substance and lots of other receptors for different species play a role in whether the red cell becomes infected or not. Okay. Uh, but once it's inside of the red cell, although technically speaking, it's never inside the red cell, mm-hmm. it's in a vacuole that it okay. creates for itself a, parasit- a parasitophorous vacuole, vacuole. right? Yes. And it then begins to suck in the erythrocytic um, cytoplasm. And it mm. engulfs and digests hemoglobin. Right. And in exchange, it produces hemozoan, which is the leftovers of hemoglobin. And it, it digests the protein part and it rejects the heme part. Mm-hmm. And as it grows and then multiplies, it's all connected to the same cytoplasm. So it's one big organism with multinuclei until very, and, and they all produce the same amount of hemozoan. Mm-hmm. And they, they, it somehow finds its way to the middle of the cell. And then at the very last moment before this thing ruptures, each one divides off from the parent cytoplasm, assuming now the role of a single organism. And what's left behind is their toxic waste dump. Got it. Which is the hemozone molecule that's stacked up, crystallized. And that's one of the indicators that you've got malaria because once that cell ruptures, that is freely floating into the cyto- into the uh, bloodstream. Mm-hmm. It's taken up by neutrophils, for instance. You see a neutrophil with a shiny kind of a metallic... Um, refractility, I, I guess is the best way to put it. When you look at it under the microscope, uh, people that are expert at this stuff they can recognize a, a hemozoan compound uh, apart from almost anything else. And they can say, this patient has a heavy malaria infection, even so though they don't see the do parasites. The, do the merozoites uh, multiply in red blood cells? They do, but and when they do, of course, they reach a certain number, uh-huh. which is a species-specific number, right. and then... After they rupture the red cell, they okay. now invade other red other cells. cells. And this is the form the mosquito would pick up in a blood meal? No. no so this well, is, it will this pick is, them up, but it digests yeah. those. All right. What does it pick up ah, to but get infected? As this parasite begins to multiply, yes. certain numbers, instead of developing into more merozoites uh-huh. by a, a, this division process, we'll just call it uh, schizogony, which is the, the, the scientific term for that, they instead don't replicate, they differentiate Mm -hmm. into pre-sex cells called gametocytes. There's a micro and a macro gametocyte, the male and the female. And so those are the stages that when they're taken up by the mosquito, initiates the sexual stage of this infection. All right, but we're going to prevent that, all this with a And vaccine. that might be an interesting issue. Somebody referred to, you know, we, we, we do, we, we talk about Nolzai as the fifth um, human malaria. Um, but I don't know how effective Nolzai is at creating gametocytes in humans. Right. They're, they're very efficient at doing it in the monkeys, so that's why mm-hmm, you clearly mm-hmm, get the sure. malaria monkey, events. you know, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But as far as going from humans mm-hmm. and then back mm-hmm. into a mosquito, I, I don't know if there's um, compelling evidence that we're going to get productive, that's efficient gametocyte production. Point. So I don't know if humans can sustain um, Nolzai. Right. So we're going to prevent all this. We're going to interrupt at the pre erythrocytic stage, we the sporozoites. We're we going to try and make some kind of an immune response, the antibodies, T cells, both, that would block those. And in fact, these trials that we mentioned were the circumsporozoite protein Correct. infection with live attenuated or live sporozoites. These are all made to induce an immune response that would prevent infection. You bet. Now, the, pro- the approach in this paper is new, it depends on the ability to genetically modify plasmodium. Huh. And they are deleting genes. They've deleted three genes. Yes. Previously, they deleted two. It wasn't good <laughs> enough. Now they deleted three genes <laughs> exactly. that are important, that are critical for pre-erythrocytic infection. Right. So these sporozoites will no longer be able to infect erythrocytes. Right. All right. And they use this in this paper first to immunize mice and then people. Amazing, isn't it? It's it's come a long way in a very short time. Now, you have to deliver these. The way you make these is in a mosquito. Right. So you have to deliver them by a mosquito. You can't inject them yet. 
<laughs> I, I thought that was so. I, I love this sentence on page three. On the day of administration, 150 to 200 of these genetically modified infected mosquitoes were allowed to feed on the forearm of each subject for a total of 10 minutes. Can you imagine that? Some sort of a, a bag over your arm with close to 200 mosquitoes in there biting you for 10 minutes. I didn't. Well, <laughs> I just cannot imagine that. Small <laughs> price to pay if you don't get malaria. <laughs> well, they say at the end that this is not, this is not scalable. No. People are not too excited. I mean, if you, this is a proof of concept. <laughs> if you're going to go to another country from America, or Europe, and they say, "Okay, put your arm in this for ten minutes while we no, bite. No, 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 they're not going to do it. Work. So they have to. But it's a proof of concept, right? That's mm-hmm. what it is. that's exactly um, what it is. They do immunize these volunteers. Yes, but they actually do an experiment in mice first with the double knockout to show that it's it's uh, they're not they don't get sick and they don't they they do uh, make an immune response. And they're protected against challenge. This is using Plasmodium yoli, Dixon. It's a mouse. Yoeli. Yoeli. That's right. But then they go into volunteers with the triple knockout. Right. And um, they deliver them, (laughs) having them put their arm in a cage for 10 (laughs) minutes. And then they they first confirm that the mosquito actually are carrying the uh, genetically modified sporozoites. And they figure that uh, the total salivary gland sporozoite load 40,000 sporozoids per mosquitoes, per mosquito. So that's what you're getting. That's pretty big. So they, they recruit a bunch of people, healthy people in this trial, and they put their arm they put their arm in a box, right, Dixon? Yep. And then they get bitten <laughs> for 10 minutes. Listen, I, I knew someone who did this for a living. That's how he fed his mosquitoes. You know, in order to keep mosquitoes, you got to feed them. So he just said, bite the bullet and put your hand in there and away you go. And, and that's, that's an interesting did. comment. So why, you know, a lot of people <laughs> think, a lot of people think that mosquitoes ingest blood to live as a food source. But right. what we, we've talked about this before. Uh, the food source for mosquitoes is actually sugars. Yeah. That's it could correct. be fruits. That is exactly um, right. That and is exactly so the, right. the blood meal is only the female and it's only so she can produce eggs. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And only... And, you know, it's only about 1% of the females that are, as we call, double biters. So 99% of the time, the mosquito takes a blood meal, it has its eggs, that's it. It's not biting any more people. The mosquitoes only last for a couple of weeks. But 1% mm-hmm. will take that initial blood meal, will get these sexual forms, time will go by, they'll convert into the sporozoites. Yes. And then that 1% of the, that 1% female, that 1 in 100, will bite another person and infect them with the uh, with the malaria. Yep. So they have this this table with the volunteers and the total number of bites, because <laughs> I guess you can count the the bite sites, right? <laughs> between for a while, not forever, but for a while you can count the bite sites. They have between one hundred and seventy and two hundred bites per person, and uh, they do PCR to see if the plasmodium is replicating up to twenty eight days after. Inoculation. Oh, Vincent. Yes, sir. In the wild. In the wild. If you live in the tropics. You get a thousand bites a day, you told That's me once. Correct. On this show. And they don't even feel it. So what's going on there? I don't know. Blocking antibodies. <laughs> I don't know. Blocking no, no, they antibodies. have blocking antibodies against all the secretions of the so mosquitoes. They don't get any, they okay. don't get any reactions. Yeah. So a person who raises mosquitoes for a living. Maybe the first week is miserable. Yeah, and then after that. But after that, these people, know it's uh, there. So these people may have been bitten before, but they're malaria naive. Well, that's that's true. So. That is true. Anyway. So this is one no- of those issues where moderation is a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. People yeah. say everything. Case- so the one thing you don't want to do in moderation is get bitten by mosquitoes. That's right. Either get bit a whole bunch and right. you just you won't, won't even notice anymore. Or <laughs> just get bit a few times and it's not so bad. But you get just a moderate amount. It's just drive you slightly crazy oh, all the time. Oh, boy. <laughs> so the PCR shows no plasmodium uh, ribosomal RNA at 28 day, up to 28 days after infection. So they say these triple knockout parasites are completely attenuated at the pre-erythrocytic stage. They never get into erythrocytes, which is good. That's what you want, right? But are they still alive? What do you mean, are they still alive? Are those attenuated sporozoites still alive someplace? No, they're gone. There's no uh, RNA by PCR. No, but they were looking for the advanced part, right? No, I mean, there's so few for, of them. They're looking for ribosomal RNA. Yeah, but there's so few of them. And what are you going to look in? You're not going to homogenize blood. someone's liver. No, all these went to the liver. <laughs> blood. <laughs> of you know. course. So there will be nothing in the blood, but they could still be alive in the liver. I'm wondering. Do you care? Yes, I do care because I wonder why this is an effective vaccine. Why it is? Yeah. 
Well, we don't know in people if it is yet. It hasn't been tested. I know, but they had an animal study that said it was. So, And I know the person who did the original attenuation with the, with the radiation. These sporozoites last a long time. Mm-hmm. So that that's in the where liver. The immuni- in the liver. Yes, and that's Probably why the look- immunity comes in so so mm-hmm. it's in so important because maybe we just discussed a case. This guy's going to go back in the jungle. He's going to go lumbering. He's going to probably catch malaria again the next season whenever it comes in. Right? With this approach, this is a very long lived immunity. So it probably depends on lo- and on the organism remaining around a long time. Maybe just like the yellow fever vaccine uses an attenuated well. When you get bitten in the wild by a mosquito, do you get how many sporozoites do you get? It depends. Depends on how many oocysts the mosquito has on its stomach. So there's one mosquito, if they have 40,000 sporozoites in the salivary gland, you could get up to that many. You could. But these people have gotten up to 200 bites. So they get, maybe getting a lot more is also exactly. part of it too, exactly right? right? Exactly right. Unfortunately, they had side effects, <laughs> mainly <laughs> related to the large number of mosquito bites, as you might guess. <laughs> Most of it's psychological. You know, side swelling, erythema, <laughs> pruritus, all this. You know, yeah, I can yeah, yeah. I can imagine that this would be an issue and right. would be a, a deal breaker in the U.S. Right. They took sera from them, and the sera contained uh, antibodies, ah. okay, right, by ELISA. Ah. Mm-hmm. And do you like that, ah. Dixon? That I do, they I, do I do, I do. I like that a lot. The titers peaked at day 13. All volunteers were positive for anti-circumsporite IgG. Right. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So- the question is whether they're functional in blocking inv- infection using yeah, in vitro. Exactly. So do you, do you know this assay, inhibition of sporozoite traversal and invasion? What do they do for, for that assay? I think they do have a liver um, uh, cell culture system where they can yeah, actually show that. Just like you would do a virus blockage, you putting antibody in the medium before you put the virus in. So the serum from these people inhibited sporozoite invasion by 50% at day 7 and 59% at day 13. I don't know if that what that ah, means, right? right? It's not a hundred percent. It's not a hundred percent. But what would that translate to in an, in a person, right? That's, That's the question. Exactly, good question. So we don't really know. What I they think mean. the fewer the sporozoites that get in, the longer your immune system has to get used to the infection and to fight it off. Whereas if you get yeah. a whopping load to begin with, it overwhelms the immune system and you and you get yeah, sick. Right. That's the basis, I think. Then finally, they have humanized mice. Right. That they can infect with the human strain and yeah. see if you give them, if you give the mice purified IgG from the volunteers, yeah. uh, what happens. Right. Uh, they passively transfer the IgG to mice. Uh, and um, the three volunteers whose serum had the highest inhibition had the h- lowest uh, CSP titers of the five samples. Right. So uh, these. Let's see, where's the result? I, I highlighted the whole paragraph, which is not useful when I'm looking for the results. Mm. While you're doing that, please. The early results suggested that this, the circumsporozoite uh, antigen, this uh, quadripeptide, which is repeated and repeated, mm-hmm. and repeated into a protein, that's the antigenic target for immunity. So that's been cloned and sequenced and expressed and injected and with very little results. So... The, deli- the place that the antigen is delivered is critical. Mm-hmm. And in this case, a live sporozoite going into a liver cell is the place that this antigen needs to be. Mm-hmm. So how would you target the liver with, a uh, let's say, a molecular vaccine that took advantage of the fact that you know it's the circumsporozoite antigen, but you just don't get it to the right place? Is there an ISCOM or a, a liposome that you could design that would get it only to liver and no place else? Well, you know, when you, I think it, if you delivered it IV, which is what the mosquitoes are doing, yeah, it, it pretty much goes straight to the liver. Yeah, yeah. remember I mean, we always, always, reset, that's always right? why we want to sort of, we avoid first pass because yeah. that's the first yeah. thing is things want to hit. So hitting the liver is easy. Yeah. Well, uh, not necessarily. Avoiding the liver would be the challenge. Because the, remember these sinusoidal vessels are there, yeah. right? So you have to get well, past that. So I but I guess that's getting you, sinusoidal traversion. And, yeah, you know, the you whole, could, uh, you, you could, have to relive could, the life cycle. Yeah, you could you could engineer it to bind a receptor if you wanted to, I suppose. Well, uh, but, you see, they uh, didn't do that, and then they didn't no, get they good didn't. protection. But in this case, but these um, the data is overwhelmingly in favor of the fact that the circumsporozoite antigen is the target. These, but you need a living well. sporozoite to deliver it. Yeah, so these are living. Yeah, but right. that's the trick. The trick mm-hmm. is to mm-hmm. is to realize that you, you've stumbled on something here. Here's 
Here's nature. What do you want them to do? Yelling out to you. What do you want them to do? I want to get a molecular vaccine to where the sporozoite goes. You don't want to use a live sporozoite? No, of course not. (laughs) Why not? Hell no. If you could could grow them, let's say you could grow these up. Which you you can't, but say you could. Let's say you could. You know, you get over that step. You you (laughs) somehow, you know, because they are, they're doing their thing in the mosquitoes. So is there some way to have huge mosquito farm and then we we milk the mosquitoes right you know they they bite on a filter and we collect these and you inject them would that be okay i mean if you're you're you know you're you're a wealthy guy right here living here in a high resource environment (laughs) and uh you know you're gonna go off your travels to africa for a while they say here you know here you can get your sporozoite injection before you go wait a minute i've already got a yellow fever vaccine (laughs) and i have circulating attenuated yellow fever virus right I got a an attenuated a flu. I hope vaccine. I'm hoping his circ his attenuated yellow you know, fever <laughs> virus vaccine isn't still circulating. No, it's probably not here anymore. But <laughs> the point is, that when I got it, it certainly was. So yeah. I'm not a I'm not adverse to harboring yeah. an I mean, organism. If, is it just a technology? Is, is it just a technological challenge, or would you have a problem if we could give you sporozoites? I mean, this if, seems I, I wouldn't have a problem with it if I was guaranteed that this would not revert back to the. Well, world. you have to check, but you know the polio vaccine. The saving vaccine stays you, with you for a month. I knew you would say that, and it reverts. So we're stopping use of that. That's right. Yeah. So and, when uh, you know something, you would have do to something. do yeah. extensive trials to make sure it didn't revert. I totally agree. But a yeah. three gene deletion, remember? I know it's a I deletion. Know. I know that's pretty good. No, I'm thinking about the treatment for AIDS. Yeah, it's a three pronged approach, right? The three drugs. But I think here is interesting. I mean, the polio vaccine, right, can revert because there's just a couple of mutations. Yeah, that's right. This, that's is, this, this is different. This thing. is big chunks that that's are right. gone. Yeah. And, plus, yeah. plus one big other thing. Come on. Let's say other, it. Let's say the big thing. Well, the polio virus, it's a... It's an RNA virus. And? It mutates at high frequencies. No, what It needs a cell in order to reproduce. <laughs> yeah. Where do the sporozoites grow up? Well, don't they go into... Where do they grow up? The, the livers? I mean, no, the, in the mosquitoes. Oh, they so they're in the they're mosquito. free of the, yeah. So but these are you know. never going to divide. Yeah. Ever. So why would it revert then? It won't. Yeah, it's not. So and even if it does. Then why are you complaining? But yeah. if it reverts, of course, <laughs> this is all go good. Complete, if it reverts, it could <laughs> go on to complete talked, the life. Yeah, there's no, there's no sexual cycle here where None. it can get recombination okay. or anything. I think so. Dixon just thought it through and came up with yeah. this. Really so I think good. we're good. We're going to make a whole bunch of this. We're going to give it, it to you. It. So <laughs> let me get back to this mouse, this humanized mouse. I think it was mouse. 5A where you looking for, where they actually took the, the looking for the efficacy of yes. the- Yes, so they took the humanized mouse, which can be infected by- P, uh, P. falciparum, right. and they passively transfer IgG from the patients, and they challenge them. Uh-huh. So an, an unprotected uh, mice will, will get infected. Yeah, yeah. But three of the five day 13 IgG from the patients inhibited liver infection by 70%. So not all of them, not all of them. and it wasn't 100%. Nope. So there is, there is some protection of these mice, but it's not great. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless- um, It's better than nothing. You think they will go to a phase two here with this? They might. It depends, you know, because if this has the potential for lowering the death rate, that's really the ultimate of a vaccine in this case. Lower the death rate, not the morbidity rate, the death rate. That's that's significant. Even if it was fifty percent, it would be worth it. Mm. I mean, they say in the in the discussion, a live attenuated vaccine delivered like this is not practical or scalable. No, it is. We have to figure out how to inject them. But right now, they can't produce these, and they say maybe we could make, take them out of mosquito salivary glands, but that's ridiculous. You know, they right? tried that. The, the Stephen Hoffman tried that, and it, you know, it was laborious yeah, in fact, to we, the nth degree. We did degree. that paper on TWIP we years did. ago. We did. But it, it works, did. but... It works, but it's brute force biology. It's brute force biology. So I think they're not going to do a phase two with this because... Right. So wait a minute. They with can't viruses. even get enough people. Listen, Dixon, okay. this piece, these this study was done in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. Right. Which is which is a typical phase one, right? Right. Phase two, much more is needed and I don't So think would it be easier it. to think about this if there were a cell culture system that produced sporozoites at will? Yeah. Is that a missing say, link? Yes. That's it. That's it's what a people missing have to link. do. That's why you need to come back and get back in the lab. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> yes, the sporozoite production in culture would be it. That would be it. Mm. Um, that would which, be uh, that's probably a yeah. tough call, but yeah, well, that's what you would need. You know, if you look at where these 
organisms reproduce also because the ookinete, which is the sexual product of exflagellation plus the macrocomenocyte, when they fuse together to produce this ookinete, it migrates through the gut tract of the mm-hmm. mosquito. Mm-hmm. And it goes between the cells. It doesn't go into a cell. It goes between the cells and it lies up underneath the uh, connective tissue that holds the gut tract intact. So that's where it starts to develop. That's a very interesting site because that's not reproducible with a tissue culture system. That's a 3D model. That's an organ culture system. Mm-hmm. That's not a cell, cell culture but system. That, but that's sort of but where we're what? heading now, right? But now we're working towards even that. Yep. So eventually, maybe you could make a mosquito gut Yeah. in vitro. Sure. If you could do that, you're in. So it'd be like 3D printed, right? There you 3D go. 3D print a mosquito. Well, Dixon, do you remember on Twiv? You could 3D print it'll be, that, it'll be one of those big, with. huge mosquitoes from Monsters Inside <laughs> me, right? <laughs> well, wait a minute. There's a, there's a model of a mosquito at the, Muse- the American Museum of Natural History that will scare the bejesus out of you. But if you know your mosquito biology, you won't be afraid. Dixon, remember on Twiv we talked about... And- Enter- enteric organoids. We remembered. You can take stem cells and differentiate them into mm-hmm. walls of cells that look sort of like. Yeah. You could do the same thing with mosquitoes. Maybe That's you could true. produce sporozoites. And, That's right. right. So this model at the museum. Let me just finish this thought because you weren't done. For little kids, it's quite <laughs> frightening to see a gigantic mosquito that big. Right. Guess which mosquito they made. Hopefully, it's the male. Yes, it's the male. So we don't have to worry. They made it a male mosquito. Yeah. Why would you do that? Because they don't know. It has no they relevance whatsoever to anything that I can yeah, think they of. They don't know. Honest. They did not know that those are not the ones that you were worried about. Well, they might have it's known, but they might have just, I don't know why they did that, but um, I wish they had met a female mosquito instead. Or they're both of them, you know? Let's move on. Let's move on. Do, do you, uh, <laughs> okay. Daniel, any, did you make want to make any other comments on this No, paper? no. I, I, actually, I think this is a great, great paper, but I, I think as we point out, there's that challenge. Of yeah. course. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful um, conversation starter. Well, you're never short for words, Dixon. I wouldn't say that. You know, you are never quiet. Not that it's a bad thing. Really? You always talk. Really? That's why I first invited you to TWIV 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years. Because I knew you would talk. 20,000 If you don't show ago. up, you can't talk, right? This is all true. Da- Daniel, we yes. would love to have another case. I have another so, case. Excellent. Get out. I did it. <laughs> And uh, this is a case we're going to say thanks from thanks to the Peace Corps, right? They Peace Corps sends people to all it's these places. We're sort of, and we're recur- we're returning to our theme, right? Remember, our theme was that when people go to these places to help, and then they get sick. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to give you a little context for what happens is a lot of times with the Peace Corps, they'll go somewhere initially where they'll be trained, and then they send them out into these um, often remote locations, mm-hmm. and they'll be you know, wells and bridges and teachers, and they do all kinds of stuff. And often they're pretty remote, staying with a host family, and when they get into trouble, it's a telemedicine approach. And and Mm. I I share with you guys a bunch of cases that um, from the Peace Corps. And so then you make a telephone call and you say, this is what's going on, and then they try to recommend um, what to do remotely. And I picked a case here, actually, where um, that remote um, consult Re- results in actually a confirmed mm. lab diagnosis. So, but I hope people enjoy this. Well, they uh, have in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the case here of a 24 year old female. She's serving. Um, that's how they refer to being in the Peace Corps. Uh, she's serving in Cameroon as a Peace Corps volunteer. She's teaching English and science in the local school. She's been in the country um, for about five months at this point prior to her having any symptoms. Um, For her first three months, she lived with a host family in their home and has now been in her own home in the community. Um, And this is a home that has electricity, uh, (laughs) which is, as we pointed out from my recent stay in the DR, you don't always have electricity and running water, but the Peace Corps likes to have at least, they sort of think of that as a basic thing, Mm -hmm. running water, electricity. Um, she's 12 hours from Yaoundé, which is the capital of Cameroon, and she, she's having intermittent diarrhea, she's having loose stools, and abdominal discomfort. Uh, this is a previously healthy volunteer, no prior medical, no prior surgical, no allergies, They're reporting significant problems in the family. Um, these people get examined before they go, and they also get um, a full dental exam. It's actually a big thing. You don't want to run into dental problems out in these areas. 
Um, she doesn't take any medications. Um, as mentioned, she's uh, working as a teacher, so you could think about exposures to the young children. Um, she uh, lives with, initially, as mentioned, the local family, but now in her own home. Um, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. Uh, she's originally from the U.S., and this has been her overseas experience in Cameroon. I'm um, going to give you a little bit of exposure history. Um, it's unclear whether or not she's been walking barefoot, but um, there's... <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there are lots of animals present. And they make a phone call to the local Peace Corps medical contract person. And they say, I've been having intermittent diarrhea. I've been loose stools, abdominal discomfort. I don't feel well. Um, what should I do? <laughs> right? So we have a pretty broad. Why, why are you laughing? Uh, because there are so many choices. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> At this so, moment, uh, is she, uh, uh, what, is, what has she been eating? Um, uh, she's been eating all kinds of local fare. Does she cook it? Um, she cooks some stuff in her home, yep. And uh, if she doesn't cook, where does she get the food then? Um, you can get it from, there's a local, you can buy it actually locally. Actually, this has a French twist to it, so I imagine they eat pretty well in Cameroon. Do they eat raw meat? Uh, good question. You know, it's not usually popular, right? I think we've talked about Ethiopia, parts of the Sudan. There's kitfo, which is a raw beef dish, but here in Cameroon, it's not particularly, yeah. So she um, does she is she eating meat vegetables both? Yes, meat vegetables. She doesn't have any dietary restrictions. Any and mangoes? <laughs> she does not eat. She does not report mango eating. Ah, <laughs> fish? Any fish? No, she's inland, so she doesn't no report fish. any. It fish. could be freshwater fish. Yeah, but she isn't telling she us. She about sleeps fish. in in a house, right? They, you know, one thing they're good about, right, is mosquito nets, right? That's right. So with mosquito nets. So mosquito right. nets. Right. Right. Um, and she uh, is, you know, I don't care about sex because diarrhea, right? I mean, although he, actually, does she, yeah, I'm, yeah, you know, Cameroon was the origin of AIDS. So, <laughs> she so she's AIDS? not sexually active, not um, sexually while active. in country. Okay, and uh, no, um, okay, not sexually active, and she's AIDS negative. You said right. Mm -hmm. This was sudden onset or gradual? Gradual. gradual. It's gradual, and it isn't. It isn't major. It's. It's just some some sort of vague abdominal discomfort, yeah, yeah. some intermittent diarrhea. She's just not feeling great. She's probably homesick. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, the timing is the timing is helpful. There's I always talk about there's like the first two or three weeks, which is tough. Yeah. And then when they transition, they do yeah. usually local training. Then the first two or three weeks after the local training is tough. Usually by this point, right? She's been um, she's been there for five months. She's in that sweet zone. Usually when people are yeah, yeah, quite yeah. happy and and she's quite happy there, she just concerned about this right, abdominal uh, discomfort. Tell us a little bit about this school. These are kids of what age? Um, they're young kids, so say six to 12. Mixed, mixed boys, six girls. Six to 12 years. It's actually kids? nice, right, in Cameroon. It's, it's, there's no restrictions. Men and women, girls right. and boys can and learn. How many kids are in a room with her? Um, I think it's about 20. 20 in a room. Mm -hmm. And these little kids don't speak English, and she's there to teach them how to do that. She's teaching them English and right. science. Does she right. touch them? I'm sure she touches them in, and, uh, in an appropriate way. Yes, of course. And uh, <laughs> about, are, are any of them unwell or they're all fine as far as we know? You know, it's Cameroon. It's a rural village. Um, you know, we, we always talk about uh, where's where's Peter Hotez when you need him, right? I mean, um, you know, what what would you think would be common and endemic in these kids, right? How many, how many of these kids don't have some sort of... Um, yeah, right. What about animals? Yeah, so there's right. lots of animals. Lots of Do animals. they roam freely into the classroom and out? And <laughs> kids keep their pets next to <laughs> of them. Of course. A little pet monkey on their shoulder and a um, parrot no, on the other No one. pet monkeys are reported. Okay, but, no pet monkeys. Yeah. Does um, she have any pets? She does not. All right. Um. So she's, she's in this... What was I going to ask you? I've forgotten. All right. Does she, know, does she remember anything remarkable about the water? No, does she eat at school? No. Interesting question. Does she remember any events prior to when she started to feel bad that might have correlated with the onset? Like, no. you know, breakdown in public health for drinking water or some heavy rain or something that might have washed something into their drinking water supplies, that sort of thing. She doesn't. She doesn't. Okay. And I think, as I pointed out, she's not horribly sick, right? Yeah, no, no, Just I got it. loose stools, just not feeling oh, so great. Listen. Been there for five months now. Uh, this is like three or four weeks duration. 
Yeah, it's been at least going on for a week, she's noticed. A week. But water, where does she get her water? Um, I do not know, actually. That's a good question. Okay. Wonder if she filters it or treats it or what, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, they usually recommend boiling or some sort of Is she on any malarials? Um, no, she's not. Really? It's interesting. A lot that of people, when they've been in country for a while, will not necessarily take uh, their anti-malarial. I do so. know this. I do know this, but that's why I asked. Yeah. So this, the, the length of this illness is how, how much? It's been going on for a few weeks. A few weeks. Anybody else sick in the classroom? In the absenteeism? Wait, wait. We just <laughs> talked about that. Did we? Did you remember? Yeah, we, we, we asked just sort of in general. Because I wasn't like, listening was, at the time. I was, was thinking of my next status. question. <laughs> but no, no, we didn't report anyone having, we'll say, acute illnesses, right? No, but I mean ab- absenteeism. You asked about absenteeism or just yeah, illness? Yeah, if any kids in the class were sick. Yeah, right. we don't have any reports of right. any like specific absences. Right. Or, okay. I mean, you know, did some kid come up to write on the board and then vomit on her? Right. Now, remember, this is an endemic zone for things like what? loss of fever, Ebola. Yep. She doesn't have those. I should mention no fever, no rash. Right. No fever, no rash. Yeah, just abdominal discomfort, not just feeling so great. Okay. It was in Cameroon that in the early 20s, a uh, chimpanzee was slaughtered by a hunter, and the hunter caught SIV from the chimp, and that started the AIDS epidemic. There go. Cameroon. There you go. Yeah. So to, to give our, so this, this is, I'll say, um, what am I expecting our emailers to tell us? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we talked, the last one I thought was pretty, you could basically say, I know what it is. You gave me all the information. Mm-hmm. Here it's pretty broad. So what I'm going to ask people is, you know, here, if you took this phone call, you know, what, what would you, what would be good advice? What would right. be any sort of testing that you might recommend? It's going to be a little bit of an issue if you send her for testing. But in this case, I will, she did go for some tests. What would you expect to see? Right, she's mm-hmm. been in this area for five months now. Um, what would you anticipate to see if you did particular testing, and then what might you do about it? And then how would you sort of you know judge whether or not you think that what you found and treated, etc., um, mm-hmm. impacted okay. her? So beautiful, yeah. very nice. Yeah, well, and this you know just to be, I'm saying I don't think anyone can look at it and say I can tell it's this. You know, yeah, no, right, I right. don't you know, think so. It, I don't think okay. So. Right. Do you have a parasitology I do. superhero? I do. I didn't last time, but I do this, this time. This would be the second one now, you right? You tweaked my memory back into reality. And so what we'd like to do is feature people who were the trailblazers for this um, scientific discipline of parasitology or parasitic diseases or tropical medicine. Uh, they all fall into the same category eventually because it's not a this or that. It's an inclusive definition, right? So... One of the most influential people that had an that had an impact on everyone else's life after that, who actually people wanted to follow in their footsteps, was an investigator. And in this case, there weren't investigators when this guy lived. <laughs> it was back in the 1600s in Italy, but the Renaissance was in full swing, and the Renaissance, of the Age of Enlightenment, basically, uh, was essentially someone got permission to start to think there was no restrictions on thinking out of the box. You know, the, the sun is not the center of the universe and the does not resolve revolve around the earth. Uh, Galileo dropping objects off the leaning tower of pizza, all kinds of wonderful experimentation going on. Some people, of course they got punished for their thoughts after they discovered something that violated theological dogma <clears throat> but in this case no the man the man's name is reddy i believe his first name is anthony anthony reddy and he was a global thinker this person had ideas about everything and his his reason for being so to speak was that he li- loved myth myth busting he was a myth buster uh of the first order so if you know that show on television the myth bust uh, this he would have been the founding father of this one and he was one of the original men of science in the, in the renaissance he conducted investigations into the origins of life and established the experimental control as a means of comparing an unaltered situation to one that was being manipulated and it was a simple experiment actually he took two flasks everybody seems to remember this from our high school biology lessons but for those of you that didn't have that luxury of knowing this 
particular person. He took two flasks and he took the same piece of meat and divided it in half and stuffed one half in one flask and the other half in the other flask. And then, cleverly, he covered the mouth of the second flask with a piece of gauze to allow air in and out, but nothing else, and waited. And, you know, if spontaneous generation of life does occur, it should have occurred in both flasks. But in fact, it only occurred in the one without the cover. And uh, proving to everyone's satisfaction, at least that it, at least with regards to flies, uh, that they don't arise spontaneously, that there's something going on here. And then he didn't stop there, though. He kept looking. What is unique about the fly that I'm missing? What, what needs to go through this membrane? And, of course, the fly does. And then when he started to look closer <clears throat> with a hand lens, he could see little wiggly white things, which were not flies exactly, but if he waited long enough, they became flies. So he also championed the concept of an egg being the origin of life for lots of different things. In addition to that, he began to collect stuff. He was like a, a Linnaeus of his day and he collected so many different things. And many of them turned out to be parasites. He described over 180 different kinds of parasites, which included a number of arthropod ectoparasites and endoparasites like pieces of tapeworm and ascaris that had been passed by people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he correctly determined that many parasites grow up from eggs, making significant contributions to the germ theory of disease. And in addition to all of his scientific contributions, because he was a man for all seasons, he was a poet. He wrote beautiful poetry, and of course, it's all in Italian, old Italian, and, and I don't read any Italian, so I can't tell you how beautiful it is, but people of his day claimed that he was a gifted poet. But you can find out all about him if you visit Florence, because his life-size statue stands proudly looking down on all who visit the world-renowned Uffizi Museum. And so I think that of all of the superheroes of parasitology, he is the first one. He should have gone first, but I, I didn't mention him first. But but he is the uh, the champion, which paved the way for everybody else. Thank you, Dixon de Pommier. You're quite welcome. Let's end this episode with some email. Yeah. Connor writes, Dear T hello, Twip professors. I'm a longtime listener of Twix, started with Twiv, then found Twip. It's a warm 33 Celsius here in Muang, Ubon, Ratchathani, Thailand where I am a temporary government employee at the Office of Disease Prevention and Control. Shout out to my professors, Dr. Gerald Esch and Dr. Raymond Kuhn at Wake Forest and Dr. Mario Grijalva at Ohio University Pontifica Universidad Católica de Ecuador. They're all wonderful educators that have surely changed many lives for the better. Connor gives a, a uh, guess for the case, the raised rash that some might describe as serpiginous. As I have spent time in Western Dominican Republic and walked around without shoes, I would guess CLM. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a guess. That's a definitive answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for this wonderful gift, and Happy New Year to you and yours. Uh, Daniel, can you take Frank's, please? Let me just interject here. Yes, I know both of these other people, you Dr. Do. Esch really? and Dr. Kuhn. I have visited both of them. I've talked with them extensively in my past. Wow. They are wonderful people. They mentor beautifully, and one of them is uh, now the current... Uh, Editor for the Journal of Parasitology. That's Harold Esch. By the way, Esch, uh, Connor is at Wake Forest University. Oh, well, that's where these other two people are. Biology major, uh, right. Daniel. All right. Frank writes, dear doctor, doctor, doctors, <laughs> in TWIP number 124, you commented on the price disparity of albendazole between the U.S. and the DR. Well, Dr. Griffin pointed to the freedom of the U.S. capitalist market <laughs> and the need for balance between profits and public health. Other comments mention the expense of development and clinical trial failures. TWIP is so wonderfully authoritative that I wonder about these off-expertise comments on the beliefs of your listeners. <laughs> Research and clinical trial costs are often used to justify high pricing. A cursory review of pharmaceutical company income statements shows that R&D is about half of marketing expenses. Uh -huh. As one example, Pfizer's 2015 income statement shows selling informational and administrative SIA expenses to be 30% of sales, while R&D is only 15.7%, while still making an impressive 14% after-tax profit. And we got a link there. Average manufacturing sector profits are 5%. Even if the marketing portion of SIA is half the total, R&D is not necessary, not necessary reason for high prices. 
Many may discount this calculation, so to Dr. Griffin's point, I would direct your listeners to an alternative R&D funding system proposed by Bucknell economist Dean Baker. He proposes federal funding and patent ownership allowing free market competition for drug manufacture and pricing. He points out that patents are a means of taxing the public to support research and innovation. Another example, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, administrative costs in Medicare are only about 2% of operating expenditures. Defenders of the insurance industry estimate administrative costs as 17% of revenue. As always, thanks for taking the time to provide the greatest public education shows ever. The world needs your format and style to be more infectious and spread to all areas of science. Best regards, Frank. Right. And now, Frank, I think that these are points well taken. Indeed. And uh, I think the uh, a lot of these companies are doing less R&D, and a lot of the R&D is NIH funded, funded by yeah. taxpayers in academia, and then profits... Um, are on the shoulders of the consumers. Indeed. And so, now I... um... Steve writes, and he starts off with a link to a new study um, regarding raccoon roundworm, which is a sort of Bayless Ascaris procyonis, suggesting a subclinical infection in wildlife uh, for wildlife rehabilitators. That means that raccoons infect animals that are being rehabilitated from the wild, probably injured animals of various Mm. sorts, which is a real possibility, obviously. Never even thought about that. So he starts off with, Hi, Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel. Good to find you back in my inbox so quickly in the new year. And to see that your stable at Microbe TV has enlarged, too. And a belated happy millionth to Vincent, too. Your brief mention of parasites as hoarders might get from an excess of pets reminded me that I saw this piece on Raccoon Ascaris in ProMed Mail the other day. Looks to be a particularly nasty one to catch when it does get into humans. You further mention your further mention of someone checking in the parks for parasites for dogs and cats made me think that New York that in New York they may be finding the raccoon parasite too, and that people ought to be made aware of the risks of encouraging them to become too domesticated. All the best, Steve from London. Uh, He writes, where it seems to have warmed up after a few sub-zero days, and I can now hear myself think above the central heating pump. (laughs) Luton, Luton, not London. Oh, I'm sorry, Luton, absolutely. It's okay. Dixon, do they check for for Bayless in New York City? Not that I know of. Mm. All right. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. People should not... um, raccoons in their houses yeah they encourage them no they do encourage them they feed them at their door and they leave food out and they eat the dog food of course even if they don't encourage them so uh, they're probably a very domestic animal that live mostly in the suburbs all right the next one is very interesting (laughs) if you'd like to be amused it is from someone called massive poo who writes hello twerps i have no formal scientific or medical training but have managed a home lab for some years studying microorganisms along the following lines I have fungus in my bath in the bathroom, fungus in my bed, fungus in the kitchen, and fungus on my head. I get a parasite for Christmas and keep it quite well fed. It rides around inside my brain on a neurotoxic sled. I think it makes me rhyme all day, but perhaps now it's died. Are parasites all criminals? They spend a lot of time inside. That's very good, actually. Not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> uh, well, on with next week's case study. As a layperson, I think Dr. Griffin's case next week will have the red herring of a do-gooder that doesn't wear shoes. <laughs> In this case, the victim will be attacked by a face-eating spider, <laughs> or to use the Latin name, Faccio Spidercium. I think this is a joke about your next case. <laughs> the life cycle of the face-eating spider begins and ends with a mature female laden with eggs who hides under people's beds at night and giggles. Until it can hear the sound of snoring, Uh this triggers the spider to climb onto the bed and jump on the victim's face, squirt the eggs into the rosy part of the cheek. This serves two functions of masking any rash or soreness and the closeness of blood vessels to the surface of the skin and injection site affords an easy meal for the hatching larvae. The circadian rhythms of the host, usually a mature male of advancing years, (laughs) Dixon, trigger the larvae to erupt through the skin and crawl to the nearest ear duct or nasal canal where they proceed to masquerade as nose hairs and ear hairs and feast on boogies and earwax. Oh, dear. The female young do this until pregnant and then scarper under the bed again to repeat the process. 
I hope it is not too dispiriting to find a lay person and virtual novice can solve these problems without any research. <laughs> but as Darwin once said, if you need to study, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Best wishes and kind regards for all your fun and capers. I suppose you have added to the sum of human knowledge in a right prodigious way. Too many congrats. <laughs> that was great. Did Darwin really say that? Well, I hope not. <laughs> you need to study, you're doing it I wrong? Not. I hope not. All right, the last one, Dixon. Please. Right, Dave writes, uh, hosts with the mosts. Sorry that this is a question from the beginning of the show, but just started listening at 119 and now working from the start to catch up. It was mentioned that a team of explorers heading for the North Pole by balloon went down and had to live on polar bear meat to survive. You mentioned that when the explorers' bodies were found, they were infested with trichinella from eating polar bear meat. My question is, do fish carry trichinella? My reasoning is that the mainstay of polar bears are seals, and the mainstay of seals is fish. Therefore, the only, not quite almost, source of trichinella for the polar bears would be fish. Couldn't find an answer online, but didn't check very far. Dave, the sheep shearer in southern Alberta, Canada, where it is 2 plus C, and the Chinook wind has died down. Ooh, Chinook wind. All right, let me say that polar bears are meat eaters, and they don't eat just seals. They eat lots of other things, too, including each other sometimes. But they also come on dry land for about half of the year. Churchill uh, is a great place to go to see polar bears, for instance. When the ice has gone out on Hudson's Bay, they have nowhere else to go but. They are prodigious garbage pickers. They also eat lots of carrion which wash up on shore. And, um, for instance, walruses have been found to be a source of trichinella, and supposedly they are only eating mollusks, but they do occasionally eat other things too. It's apparent otherwise. No. So the answer, first of all, is no, fish don't get trichinella. They do not. They're at the wrong temperature. All right? That's, that's a real key here, because if it's below body temperature, like 37 for us, but slightly lower or higher for other mammals, Um, then the parasites do not infect those animals at all. And in fact, there are some very interesting studies done on hibernating animals like hamsters, which Mm -hmm. when their body temperature drops, you cannot infect them with trichinella. So it's a temperature-dependent thing. So I don't know of any trichinella-like organisms that are in fish, but I know that seals eat other things besides fish as well. You know, nothing eats just one thing. Mm -hmm. I saw a wildlife film once about a bunch of hippos in Africa, they were just sort of hanging around doing nothing. And then all of a sudden, a, a gazelle jumps into the water that they were swimming in and swims to the other shore. This really pissed off the hippopotamus. Mm-hmm. One of them rushed out of the water like it was the angriest thing in the world, ran over and killed the gazelle. <laughs> Not just killed the gazelle. The rest of the hippos came out of the water and helped it consume it. Hippos eat meat? That's what I thought you'd say. There's documentation for this. The film actually shows wow. the carcass was completely consumed by the hippopotamus. And if you go a, a survey of wild animals for trichinella, there are very few things that you cannot find it in. Okay, That's where the, the polar bears get it. So. That's right. So a lot of um, whaling ships used mm-hmm. to throw their garbage on shore. Ah. Uh, people would die, and they would bury the, the person. Of course, they would freeze. And then the polar bears would come along and dig them up and eat them. Yeah. So that's maybe where the trichinella got started. Also, the whalers used to capture local uh, wildlife to eat and probably throw the carcasses back. Oh, they extincted land whole and, bunches. And of them. the white, uh, the that's, polar bears would probably eat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you right. go. So there are a lot of ways that polar bears can catch this infection. A lot of ways to get trichinella. You betcha. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. You can find Twip at iTunes, microbe.tv slash Twip. And I'm sure most of you. Listen on your phone or uh, la- tablet, which means you use a podcatcher app and you simply subscribe. You can search for TWIP on it and you'll get it. Think about supporting our work. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute and uh, you can find a couple of ways to help us like Patreon and other ways. And that will let us travel this year. We have some travel plans. Take along some of the other hosts beside myself and that'll be a lot of fun for people that are that are there where we're doing our shows. We we do like to get your questions and comments. And of course, we love getting your guesses about the uh, cases. Mm. You can send those to twip, T-W-I-P at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier 
is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. And also, if you like fish, you should check out, well, that's thelivingriver.org. Right. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. A website that he has produced with Daniel Griffin, who is also at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. Find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back real soon. <laughs> Another TWIP is, is parasitic. parasitic.